Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the acute inflammatory response and uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, so we're now looking at type 2 activation of endothelial cells, which is undertaken by interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, which are released by uh, resident macrophages and dendritic cells upon uh, sensing a pathogen in the uh, local area. Okay, so we've looked at what interleukin-1 does. It overall leads to the activation of the nuclear factor kappa B, NF-kappa B, specifically the P50-P65 uh, form of NF-kappa B, and also the activator protein 1. Right, so we're now going to look at how uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha is going to cause the exact same transcription factors to become activated. Okay, so let's do this. So, let's say here again is the phospholipid bi there, okay, and we have a receptor for tumor necrosis factor alpha in the phospholipid bi there of our endothelial cells, okay. So, this receptor for tumor necrosis factor alpha is what's known as the tumor necrosis factor alpha, or just tumor necrosis factor, uh, receptor 1. So, it's the first type of the receptors for tumor necrosis factor. So tumor necrosis factor receptor 1, and it's often abbreviated to TNF for tumor necrosis factor, and then R for receptor, and then you put a 1 after it. So that's all plain uh, common sense. Okay, so let's color this in in purple here. Okay, and now what's going to happen is that our tumor necrosis factor specifically of the alpha form is going to come and bind to this tumor necrosis factor receptor type 1. Okay, so here comes tumor necrosis factor alpha here. Okay, let me just move this up a little bit. And let's color in tumor necrosis factor alpha in turquoise. Now, again, what this is going to lead to is the formation of a signaler zone, which is then going to lead to the activation of the NF-kappa B and the activator protein 1. Okay, so the first protein which comes and associates uh, with the intracellular aspect of this activated tumor necrosis factor receptor 1 is a protein which is known as the TRAD protein, T-R-A and then double D. TRAD protein, and this stands for the tumor necrosis factor receptor associated via DEF domain protein. Okay, so I'll abbreviate TNF, well, tumor necrosis factor to TNF. Okay, so it's the tumor necrosis factor, and then receptor, so that's the T and the R covered here, and then we've got associated via DEF domain protein. So the associated doesn't get its own, oh yes it does, sorry, it does get its own symbol, that's the A. Tumor necrosis factor receptor associated via, via doesn't get a symbol, uh, and then deaf domain gets the double D. Okay, so that's where uh, the name TRAD comes from. So this is the tumor necrosis factor receptor associated via deaf domain protein, the TRAD protein. Now let's color TRAD in, in green here. Okay, so this is TRAD, outlined in light green here. Okay, now the next protein is going to come and then bind onto TRAD, so we'll draw this here. Okay, and the next protein down is a protein that's often abbreviated to RIP1. Okay, and this stands for... Well, firstly, there's a bit that doesn't have any symbols. The RIP stands for receptor interacting protein, but in front of that, you usually put the serine threonine kinase to remind ourselves that this is a serine threonine kinase. So this is the serine threonine kinase receptor interacting protein. Okay, so receptor interacting protein. Let me just, oh no, it's fine, it's in view. Receptor interacting protein, and then it's specifically the receptor interacting protein 1. So serine threonine kinase receptor interacting protein 1 is the full name for uh, RIP1. Okay, now this then associates with another protein, but let me just firstly outline RIP1 in the colour, so I'll outline it in yellow. So there's RIP1 in yellow, 
okay? Now the next protein is another TRAF protein, which we've already seen one of. We've saw, seen TRAF6, which stands for the tumor necrosis receptor associated factor 6. We saw it back up here. Now we're going to have another TRAF protein, and pretty much it's going to do exactly the same thing uh, for this signalosome as it did for the interleukin 1 signalosome, okay? So this is TRAF2 specifically now this time. So this stands again uh, for the tumor necrosis factor TNF receptor, whoops, forgot that, receptor, and then associated factor 2. Okay, so once tumor necrosis receptor associated factor 2 then binds onto the RIP1, uh, it then becomes active and it's now going to do the exact same thing as TRAF6 did. So again, what you have done is you have assembled this signalosome, as it's called, and this is now going to um, lead to the activation of nuclear factor kappa B and also the activator protein 1. So, just like TRAF6 up here, what we're going to do is activate a whole bunch of uh, enzymes in a cascade and it will result in the activation of a kinase enzyme uh, which will phosphorylate the inhibitor of NF-kappa B protein and that w which will then lead to the ubiquitination of this inhibitor of NF-kappa B protein and then the whole complex of the inhibitor of NF-kappa B with the NF-kappa B still bound will then go along to a proteasome, bind to the proteasome, and the inhibitor of NF-kappa B will gradually be pulled through the proteasome, and as it is, the P50 and the P65 will dissociate off, so you'll have now a free NF-kappa B, which is free to go off into the site, sorry, into the nucleus of the cell, okay? Um, in addition, what will happen is TRAF6 and TRAF2 also lead to the activation of this activator protein 1 transcription factor, the AP1. So, overall, tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin 1 binding to receptors on the surface of endothelial cells leads to the activation of two transcription factors within those endothelial cells. It leads to the activation of the AP1 transcription factor, the activator protein 1, and also the NF-kappa B transcription factor, the nuclear factor kappa B. Okay, now, what are these transcription factors going to do? Well, let's firstly just uh, go over the basics of what a transcription factor is and what it does to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Okay, so, let's say this is the nucleus of our cell here. Okay, and whoops, didn't manage to quite to get the circle to fit up. Okay, so, in the nucleus we have DNA. So I'll draw some DNA here. Okay. And the DNA has genes within it. So let's say this portion of DNA here, this is some gene, okay? Now, in eukaryotic cells, upstream of all genes, you have a region that is not coding, okay? It's a portion of DNA that won't actually be used to make protein. However, it's very important for controlling the expression level of this downstream gene. Now, what do I mean by expression level? Well, I mean how much of the gene product for this gene you actually create, okay? So, in purple here, this is this region upstream of the gene, which is known as the promoter region. So, this is the pro motor region, and now I'm going to have to try and fit that in. Okay, there we go. Promoter region. So, all genes in eukaryotic cells have a promoter region upstream of them, okay? And this controls how much of the gene product of this gene you actually make. Now, how does it do this? Well, basically, in order to actually make the gene product for the gene, RNA polymerase has to come and bind to the promoter region, and then it has to work its way along and transcribe uh, the gene, basically. It has to make a complementary strand of mRNA, which is complementary specifically to the coding strand of the DNA. And that will then go off uh, to the ribosome to be translated into protein. Okay, so 
If the promoter region has high affinity for binding to RNA polymerase, RNA polymerase will come and bind here all the time, and it will make loads of copies of mRNA for this gene, and therefore the mRNA will end up being translated, so you'll get loads of protein. Now, gene products, you can have other gene products from other than just protein, but we'll keep this simple and just think of proteins. Okay, um, so, if the RNA polymerase... Um, if the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region with high affinity, you'll get high expression of the gene. Okay? Whereas, if the promoter region has a really low affinity for RNA polymerase, then RNA polymerase will never come and bind here, or very rarely. And therefore, you'll get hardly any mRNA of this gene actually being made, and therefore hardly any protein. So the promoter region completely and utterly determines how much of the gene product of the gene, which we're assuming is a protein, uh, that you actually make. Okay, now what's a transcription factor? Well, let's draw a transcription factor here. So a transcription factor is some molecule that's usually a protein that can come and bind to the promoter region of the uh, gene and can alter the expression level of that gene by changing the affinity of the promoter region for RNA polymerase. So you can get enhancer transcription factors which increase the affinity of the promoter region for RNA polymerase and therefore increase uh, the expression level of the downstream gene because if RNA polymerase now has a greater affinity for binding to the promoter region once it has the transcription factor bound uh, then you're going to get more mRNA being produced and therefore more protein being produced or you can also have transcription factors which are repressors which will reduce the expression of the gene and these will decrease the affinity of RNA polymerase for binding to the promoter region and therefore you'll get less mRNA being produced and therefore less protein being produced. Okay, so this is what NF-kappa B and AP1 are going to do. They're going to bind to promoter regions and alter gene expression within the cell. They're going to increase the expression of some genes and decrease the expression of other genes. We're specifically going to be interested in them increasing the expression of genes. They're the most important ones that are going to uh, cause type 2 activation within the endothelial cell. Okay, so... The question now is, which genes are upregulated by these two transcription factors, NF-kappa B, the nuclear factor kappa B, and the activator protein 1? Okay, well, let's start off, because there are quite a lot of these, basically, but we'll start off with COX-2 as the first target. Okay, so one of the proteins that you are now going to hugely increase your expression of within these endothelial cells is a protein known as COX-2, and this stands for cyclooxygenase 2. Okay, so this should be ringing bells, um, because we've already seen a cyclooxygenase enzyme in this video. We've seen cyclooxygenase 1. Okay, so let me just try and find the piece of paper where we did this. Uh, here we go, I think. Yes. Here is cyclooxygenase 1. It, remember, does this conversion of arachidonic acid to prostaglandin G2 and then prostaglandin H2. And then prostaglandin H2 can be acted upon by prostacyclin synthase to make prostacyclin, which is then released from the endothelial cell and causes uh, vasodilatation by relaxing the smooth muscle cells around the terminal arterioles and therefore increases blood flow uh, to the affected site, causing rubor and calor. Okay, so cyclooxygenase 1 here is always expressed in endothelial cells. They always have it in their membrane. However, cyclooxygenase 2 is a whole new uh, enzyme that usually is not expressed within these endothelial cells. Okay, so uh, the endothelial cells, however, when they have undergone type 2 activation, i.e. they've been stimulated by interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And they don't have to be stimulated by both. They usually will be stimulated by both. But, you know, it's if you only have one, then it will still do the job. Okay, they're going to start producing this enzyme COX-2, cyclooxygenase-2. And cyclooxygenase-2 will go to the membrane of the cell, 
Okay, so let's draw it here. And it's going to catalyze the same reaction as cyclooxygenase 1. But basically, it's bigger and it's better than cyclooxygenase 1. It's more powerful. It's better at doing its job than cyclooxygenase 1. And it will do it so, so much more quickly than cyclooxygenase 1. So it's going to convert arachidonic acid into um, prostaglandin G2 and then into prostaglandin H2. So it's important to understand that in order for cyclooxygenase 2 to do anything, you need the arachidonic acid. And the arachidonic acid was produced by the activation of the cellular phospholipase A2 by increased calcium in the cytoplasm, remember. So increased calcium activated the cellular phospholipase A2, which broke down phosphatidylcholine into lysophosphatidylcholine and arachidonic acid. You do not usually have arachidonic acid in the cell membrane. Okay, so to have the substrate for this cyclooxygenase 2, you need activated cellular phospholipase A2, i.e. you need type 1 activation. So this is only going to have any effect if the endothelial cells have already undergone type 1 activation. Okay, so uh, if the endothelial cells have undergone type 1 activation, however, you will have arachidonic acid in the phospholipid bile there. And cyclooxygenase 2 will now convert this firstly to prostaglandin G2 and then on to prostaglandin H2, and it will put cyclooxygenase 1 to shame basically. The speed at which it does this reaction is outstanding. The speed at which cyclooxygenase 1 does this reaction is pathetic compared to cyclooxygenase 2. So it is bigger and it is better than cyclooxygenase 1. Okay, so you're going to get a lot more prostaglandin H2 being produced, okay? And this will then go uh, to this enzyme which is in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum down here. So let's put the endoplasmic reticulum here. Okay, so this is the ER. And in the ER membrane we have, and now I can try and get its name right this time, we have prostacyclin synthase, also known as prostaglandin I2 synthase. So prostacyclin synthase, which is going to take the prostaglandin H2 here, Okay, so PGH2 here, and it's going to convert it to prostaglandin I2, also known as prostacyclin. Okay, and this prostacyclin will then be moved out of the endothelial cells and released into the interstitial space, and it will act on the smooth muscle cells that surround the terminal arterioles uh, that supply this area, and um, it will cause relaxation of those uh, vascular smooth muscle cells, which will lead to vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles, leading to increased blood flow through our infected tissue, and therefore we have the opportunity to recruit more troops from the blood. So, basically, this first part of type 2 activation, which is that you start producing this COX-2 enzyme, this is all about doing what type 1 activation does, but doing it better. And we're going to see that this is a running theme, basically, that type 2 activation doesn't really do that much more that's different from type 1 activation. It does do some things that are different, we'll see those. Um, but a main theme is that we're just doing what type 1 activation does, but by God, we're doing it better, basically. Okay, so we're now producing prostacyclin, but we are doing it far better than just uh, the type 1 activated endothelial cells we're doing. So we're improving on type 1 activation, and we're now producing more prostacyclin. Okay, so we'll uh, continue this discussion in the next video where we'll see the next uh, thing that uh, type 2 activated endothelial cells are going to do.